when it comes to health, it's really not about how you look or how you feel or even how great your friends say you look. It's really about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis and what your parents did and their parents before them. But we're not going to get into that right now. It's primarily about what you do. And right in the front of, in front of the screen here, we have what I would call the four fundamentals of health, healthy living, or in other words, the profile of a healthy person. It's basically about what that person does. If, if you see a person who does all four of these things, you can you have a good bet that this is a, a probably a very healthy person. And we're not going to go through all these, but just remember these. Um, I want to focus specifically on number three there, which says uh, proactive approach to health healthy living. That would include because of in the because of the environment we are living in today, it is just not enough to to have a positive attitude. It is not enough to have a balanced diet. It isn't even enough to know what to do when you go to the hospital. It is extremely important for you to be to stay on top of things, to be constantly, constantly learning about the things that matter, the things that are out there, the threats to our health, for instance. And that's what Dr. Eaton is going to be speaking about in the in the next few minutes. And right there, you see number three there, the threats to our health. And you, we're going to talk about what's going on right here, right now in this country, and how to protect yourself from these harmful organisms and harmful bacteria that are really, really wreaking havoc. So without much further ado, I'm going to ask Sherry to introduce the Silver Queen. <laughs> okay, I'm <laughs> glad to. <laughs> it's kind of funny if we call her that, but okay, let's see. Excuse me just a minute. Let me there we go. Cindy, are you seeing the presenter thing come up? There we go. I did. I've already done. My there we go. Okay. Dr. Eaton currently practices gynecology and preventative medicine at her wellness clinic and medical spa in Bradenton, Florida. She has a special interest and expertise in hormone imbalances, hormone replacement therapy, weight management, and anti-aging medicine. We could do a webinar on each of those, and I hope we can get her back for that. Sure. She's an expert in the clinical application of silver nanotechnology and is the medical director of Probiosil a cutting-edge medical technology group. She is a fellow of the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. She is a diplomat of the American Academy of Anti-Aging and Regenerative Medicine. A former career Army officer, Dr. Eaton is the wife of Dr. Peter Fort and the proud mother of two sons, Travis and Austin. You guys are going to love her. She is very fun. She is very friendly. And I wish we didn't live on two different coasts because she would be somebody that I would love to hang out with. So, um, Cindy, are you there? I'm ready. Okay. Good evening to everyone. It is my distinct pleasure to be here with all of you this evening at the invita invitation of Dr. Ajabadi. And I just want you to know before we get started that I have just returned from the 17th World Congress on Anti-Aging Medicine and Regenerative Biomedical Technologies in Orlando, Florida this past week. Um, Cindy? Oh, yes. Could, it seems like we're a little low on sound. Is there any way we can increase the Let's sound, see. the volume? You know, it's not like me to be low on sound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's shocking, isn't it? We were kind of shocked. I, like you really <laughs> threw me off my game there because no one ever complains about me not speaking loud enough. Can you hear me? Is that better? Yeah, this is better. Right, Sherry? Um, yeah, it's still a little bit low, but it's better. Let me um, maybe move the microphone. Maybe move the microphone closer. closer to your mouth. How is that? Is that a little bit better? Test, yes. test? Yes. Yes, okay. yes, that's good. Anyway, I was uh, telling the story that I have just returned from the 17th World Congress on Anti-Aging Medicine. This is my uh, recently acquired degree in the last few years that Sherry was speaking of. It's Regenerative Biomedical Technologies in Florida, Orlando this past week. And the A4M, which is what we call it for short because it's a lot to say over and over again, is a U.S. federally registered nonprofit organization 
that is made up of over 20,000 physicians and health practitioners and scientists and government officials from over 100 nations globally. Now, why am I bothering to tell you this? Well, I have a reason. There is a method to my madness. It is because my colleague and fellow researching scientist, Dr. Gordon Pedersen, was a featured speaker at that meeting that we just attended last week, where he demonstrated uh, the benefits of silver salt in humans as a, a general session or featured speaker. His lecture encompassed many of the subjects that we're going to discuss tonight, all of us. Wound healing, prevention, burns, antibiotic resistant pathogens, and even the swine flu. David uh, told me earlier in the week when we were discussing my subject that uh, you all love pictures, and so I have some pictures. And since pictures of cold and the cold, uh, colds and the flu was kind of boring, I've got some real whoppers. So I'll, I'll warn you before the pictures come. If you're, you know, uh, don't do well with medical pictures, you might want to just cover your eyes for a, a few slides. I'll warn you. Anyway, I call my lecture a fighting chant because let's face it, let's face it, all of us. Battling disease and illness is something humans have done since the beginning of time. And now, as you shall see over the next hour, an ancient weapon with a modern day twist is in our midst. So hopefully that has you curious and I will start on kind of a sober no a note. Uh, it's relevant but extremely unfortunate that we have upon us right now an excellent example of this never ending battle that we as human beings um, fight against even uh, as we discuss our topic tonight. Um, let's see. Cindy, the volume is still just a little bit low, so yeah. instead of, if, if the microphone's as close to your mouth as you can, we're probably just going to need you to just talk louder. Shout volume. it out a little bit. Now my yep. slide is not moving. Let me see here. There we go. Okay. Um, is that better, Sherry? Yes. Okay. The um, a swine flu outbreak, as most or all of you probably know, which began in Mexico, has now caused 86 suspected deaths there. The U.S. has declared a public health emergency and is responding as if it would be a pandemic. Um, as of my most recent check this afternoon, uh, when I came home for work and was preparing for my webinar, 40 cases in the U.S. have now been confirmed. So as of this afternoon, the World Health Organization has raised the pandemic alert severity to four from three on uh, what's a total of then a six-point scale. And to help put this in perspective for all of you, a level four severity scale for uh, an epidemic means that it's continuing human to human spread in at least one country and a level six is a full-fledged pandemic or global outbreak. So silver, which is labeled uh, by many as the penicillin of alternative medicine, is known to be effective against bacteria and flu causing viruses like swine flu and avian flu, as well as other types of virus, viruses like hepatitis C and herpes, as well as parasites and yeast and fungus. So hey, this is hey, Cindy? Yes. I hate to do this to you again, but we, we have a solution. It, the, the Silver is now well supported uh, in laboratory testing and a growing number of clinical trials. We'll get to that very shortly. Uh, and to begin with, to understand how far silver has come, it's very helpful to know where it has been. Because silver has been around for a very, very long time. Silver, the use of silver in medicine and health actually dates back thousands of years, where it's been used throughout the world as a medicine uh, and a preservative. So what I'd like to do next is give just a short overview, not to give you a detailed history le lesson, but to just give you a perspective 
um, of how long we've known and used silver, known about silver and used it. So I've made a little timeline as follows. Ancient times uh, is where we're going to start. We're going to just do a little bit about the Middle Ages. We're going to go through the colonial era and then end in the modern era just to give you a few examples. Again, this is nowhere near complete. You can read on the history of the use of silver in medicine um, all day long if you choose to pull the references, but this will give you just a nice flavor for it. So let's just look a little bit at ancient times, what was happening with silver. In ancient times, the Greeks used silver bowls and placed silver coins in wells to prevent water contamination. I find it very interesting that uh, people that throw coins in wells when they go to the Fountain of Trevi in Rome or other places think it's for luck because that's how the uh, folklore has changed uh, down through the years. But in ancient times, Hey, Okay. Oh, yes. I'm here. Okay. Uh, Hippocrates himself used finely ground silver powder to treat ulcers and wounds, and that carried uh, in into uh, medieval times, which you'll see in a minute. The Romans reported using silver compounds for medical treatments and used silver vessels to keep water, wine, oils, and vinegars pure. The Egyptians used silver in paper-like sheets uh, to wrap around wounds and used silver pens to repair bones in their surgical uh, procedures, which was depicted in many of their uh, Egyptian uh, drawings. During the Middle Ages, alchemists of the time uh, described the virtues of silver as a healing substance and the general practice of medicine as uh, recommended by Hippoc uh, Hippocrates noted earlier uh, was uh, described by the practitioners of that time. The uh, Vikings uh, used silver to treat open wounds sustained in battle and actually even put strings of silver below the water line of the hulls of their ships to prevent barnacles and to retard the growth of, of algae. One of my favorite uh, statistics from this, uh, from this time period is the theory that silverware silver plates and silver pacifiers resulted in rare deaths in nobility from the Black Plague, which essentially wiped out uh, a large portion of the population of Europe because flecks of silver actually left the silverware and the plates and were ingested into the digestive system of nobility. It circulated in the blood and it protected them from death from the Black Plague. It also resulted in a bluish hue of the skin because it was silver, metallic silver in very, very large quantities and resulted in them being referred to as blue, blue bloods. During the colonial era, Native Americans actually added powdered silver to a, a newborn's first bath to, in their culture, protect the baby from the harsh environment that they were to enter as they left the mother's womb. Um, pioneers used silver coins and milk and water to protect against bacteria and spoilage, and silver was used to line water canteens at that time. Silver now was being becoming recognized uh, at this time in our history and accepted by Western civilization uh, and was used very traditionally to treat skin infections and skin ulcers and infected wounds and burns. In the, I got ahead of myself a little bit. In the late 1800s, a German obstetrician pioneered the use of silver nitrate in the eyes of newborn babies to prevent blindness from infection. And that was in the event that the mother was uh, exposed and contracted a sexually transmitted disease. And that was known to be caused initially by gonorrhea, and later that was also recognized as a chlamydial blindness, as an as an issue for newborn babies. Um, that application became routine in American hospitals uh, by the early 1900s. Um, also in the early 1900s, the early modern era, saw the development of now electrode-produced colloidal silver, and now some of you will start to recognize that term. 
uh, and that presented a significantly superior product to the previous solids and salts and ores that were used uh, in the time prior to that. And silver colloid uh, made using electrodes was considered to be quite high tech for that time. Silver in it was now accepted as a potent germ fighter and was used orally, topically, vaginally, rectally, and even intravenously uh, by physicians as a mainstream uh, antibiotic uh, treatment. Um, in World War I and World War II, silver, sil silver foil dressings, more sophisticated but no different in theory to the ones used by ancient Egyptians, were used extensively for wound care. Uh, and that continued until just after World War II. I found it interesting in my travels and studies to find that the use of silver foil for wound care remained in the listed in the physician's desk reference uh, all the way until 1955. So um, as we progress along in the modern era, now in 1938, the Food and Drug Administration was formed. Um, and at that time, silver was in very common use against a multitude of disease entities. And antibiotics then, at the time that the, uh, when, when uh, Fleming discovered antibiotics and the patent rights to penicillin, uh, when Fleming discovered penicillin and the patent rights were purchased by the United States, penicillin began to replace silver colloid because at that time, antibiotics were significantly cheaper than silver and resistance to antibiotics obviously wasn't a use. Penicillin was just coming into being. So the re resistance to, to antibiotics that uh, continues to be a problem today was n nowhere uh, near being a problem at that time. Um, by 1940, there were close to 50 different silver compounds on the market being used to treat just about every known infectious disease. The problem was they varied greatly in composition as well as in effectiveness, and the competing technology of antibiotics was just much more consistent. Resistance, again, was not an issue, and antibiotics were much cheaper to produce than silver was. So the, cost that the, the fact that the cost of silver was so much more than the cost of antibiotics, and the fact that silver solutions could not be patented at that time resulted in the development of a much more profitable and potent uh, infection-fighting antibiotics. And they, they now began to replace silver as the standard of care and the choice for medical treatment. So silver kind of left the scene until the 1970s when silver-coated fabrics and dressings were implemented to treat complex bone infections. Um, and silver ointments such as silvadine and some of the other creams that were coming at that time began, became the number one treatment for uh, burns in, in burn centers within the U.S. I find it interesting that in Science Digest as late as uh, March of 1978, despite the fact that antibiotics were booming and the biopharma industry was booming, Science, Science Digest still claim that service silver was our mightiest germ fighter ever. And mm. the airline industry reported using silver water filters to protect passengers from waterborne disease at that time. By about 1990, um, oh, I also wanted to mention that silver water uh, filters were not just used in the airline industry. They came into being and were very popular uh, for sw the swimming pool industry when, as an alternative to people who were not able to tolerate chlorine or bromine. In the 1980s, NASA uh, chose silver -based, uh, a silver-based water system for the space shuttle and silver-coated catheters and silver-coated heart valves and silver-coated joint replacement uh, hardware began to get very popular. Now, it's that, it, that was in the 1980s. In the 1990s, it really came as a resurgence because the catheters were much easier to, it was easier to bind the silver to catheters than it was to bind them to hardware until they started making 
hardware out of titanium. And there's been a real resurgence of silver to coat catheters and hardware, as well as to use silver as an alternative medicine since 1990. And part of the reason for the resurgence of the promotion of silver is because by the 1960s, I'm sure a lot of you can remember that the resistance to penicillin and methicillin really began to become an issue for infections. And by the 1990s, an interest in silver as an alternative really started to uh, get st uh, stoked up again. Um, in 1997, the FDA issued new guidelines regarding the labeling of colloidal silver as it started to make a comeback. No antibiotic terms were allowed at that time um, by the, as ruled by the FDA, FDA, and silver was to be sold only as a mineral supplement. No medical claims were allowed on the label. In June of 2000, the World Health Organization now began to actually issue warnings that drug resistance in developed nations were threatening to make these diseases uh, incurable. And the U.S. Centers for Dece uh, Disease Control and Prevention, what we call the CDC in, in America, stated that and recognized that this problem, quote, isn't going to go away, uh, and cited 88,000 deaths per year in the U.S. from hospital infections, many of them from resistant bugs. In 2001, a manufacturing patent was approved for SilverSol, which is going to be uh, my specific focus, and we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a few minutes. And engineered nanosilver products uh, were proven to kill pathogens in, pathogens in very, very, and when I say ultra-dilute solution, I mean very, very low concentrations is what is meant by the term ultra-dilute solutions. In 2004, uh, VA hospital contracts began to use silver products as supplements. And in 2005, the U.S. government and humanitarian uh, organizations abroad began to use silver products throughout the world, most notably for the fight against AIDS and malaria. And there's quite a bit published on that. So as you can see, the development of antibiotic resistance and the increase in the number of strains of bacteria and viruses worldwide have definitely renewed our interest in silver. I visited London two Christmases ago with my children and uh, was impressed to, to see one of the first exhibits I saw in the London Museum was a large MRSA uh, exhibit with a big banner across the top of the exhibit that said antibiotics, curse or cure. And it was just a very interesting article about the proliferation of methicillin-resistant pathogens and the epidemic problems in Europe as well as the United States. So the development of antibiotic resistance and the increase in the strains of bacteria and viruses worldwide have renewed our interest in silver very much. Now, so now our perspective is well in place. Let's get down to brass tacks a little bit here. What is silver salt technology? What is silver salt technology? What does that mean? And how does silver salt work? Well, simply put, I would say that silver salt describes silver particles that are dispersed in purified water. The term sol, which is going to be new to some of you, uh, versus colloid or ionic, is a chemical designation of a pure mineral which is permanently suspended in water. And it's permanently suspended in water where the mineral's charge is transferred throughout the entire body of water. So let's talk about that for just a second. The reason that the silver particles are able to be suspended in water and not settle to the bottom, as a colloid can sometimes do, has to do with the nanotechnology. And it has to do with the minuteness of the particle. A nanoparticle is extremely small. And nanotechnology is that technology which is used to turn it into this very small particle. 
Now, lots of people ask me questions about nanotechnology. How do you make? How do you do it? How is it done? And I would say to you that if you want to try to wrap your brain about around nanotechnology just a little bit better, there are excellent, excellent videos that you can visit on Google online at Berkeley, where the original the uh, Society for Responsible Nanotechnology research began. And there's a lot of animation and videos there that will help you understand how small a nanoparticle truly is. And just to throw some numbers your way, for instance, when you say something is measured in nanometers, something that's made by nanotechnology that's measured in nan nanometers, a nanometer, nanometer is one thousandth of a micron. It is one millionth of a millimeter. It is wow. one billionth of a meter. Wow. So just understand how tiny that is. And it is, you, you could have a whole discussion about nanoparticles and nanotechnology that is way beyond the scope here. But for those of you that are interested, I would encourage you to visit that nanotechnology website at Berkeley and look at, at some of the video there. You'll be fascinated. In, in, in a nutshell, when you take a particle like silver and you squeeze it down into this teeny tiny one billionth of a meter, the properties change. It, the properties become very unique, and it is no longer like other silvers. And in fact, it is like almost a three-dimensional projection into the periodic table of chemical elements. It's really quite interesting. Silver sol preparations are manufactured with patented technology using 10,000 volts of alternating current versus just 110 volts of direct current, which is used to make a typical colloid. The result is a pure silver core, which is missing two electrons in its outer shell. Now, understand that that particle, that silver core, missing two electrons in its outer shell, is now a supercharged silver solution with a different atomic structure than typical colloidal or ionic silvers. Again, you're projecting almost into the periodic table. You've now changed the particle at the atomic level. And this uniquely structured particle, this uniquely structured particle can kill pathogens in a rapid fire fashion. In fact, it can kill thousands more path pathogens at this ultra dilute, very small concentration when compared to simple colloidal or ionic silver. And when I'm talking to my patients about that, this is how I like to describe that, as it was described to me. It is the difference between using a pop gun to kill something versus a rapid fire submachine gun to kill something. Hmm. Only you do it on a very, very, very small level. That becomes very important because when you can use a very dilute solution with a powerful punch like that, then the risk of, to of toxicity approaches zero. So it's very, very important from a toxicity standpoint. So now you see that not all silver solutions are created equally. And the terminology colloidal versus ionic versus nano can be very confusing. People ask me about it all the time. Because it is not, those three terms are not and never have been used consistently or to any very well-defined standard, in my opinion. So I explain it that way so that you can understand how supercharged this particle is at a very, very low concentration, which absolutely minimizes uh, the risk of toxicity. There are many different, uh, many differences between all the different types of preparations. There are some 5,000 companies in the U.S. that produce, uh, or in the world, that produce some type of silver product. And the concentration and sizes of particles can vary greatly. Again, that is a debate that could last all week long. And it's, it's way beyond the scope of where, where we're trying to go right now. But just understand that there are great differences and many different types of preparations. There, can, there may also be variances in the purity of solutions, and all of that can impact 
bioavailability and effectiveness. One of the reasons that I chose silver cell technology in my practice and in my research and in my work of the last five years is because the, uh, because it is a patented product, and of course I've had physicians say to me, and this is a correct statement, you can patent anything. A patent just means that you have something unique someone else hasn't had, but this is a patent that has patent claims, and the claims are backed up by quite a bit of research. This is really the, my reasoning for choosing Silversol. It, it's because of the scientific research that backs it and the, and the patent claims which are backed by the research. So I just want to I'll uh, quickly review some of the claims on the patent. The silver saw patent claims action against uh, gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. We know that to be true. Um, it uh, has action against viruses. We've already talked about swine flu. Swine flu, when I say influenza, I am including just the general uh, types of influenza. Swine flu, like avian flu, is a, a subtype of influenza A. But also other viruses, a lot of work is being done currently with hepatitis C. The AIDS virus is a, a hot uh, button, and that's being studied quite actively now, as well as herpes and other types of viruses. The uh, silver is active against parasites. And what comes to mind right now, I have a lot of people in South and Central America asking me about some parasite work that we're going to begin on, but we know for a fact that the silver is effective against um, leishmaniasis, which is being used in the desert by our troops that are deployed. That comes from a bite from the sandfly um, in the uh, uh, desert climates. And the biggest parasite we studied prior to that has been malaria. And we've had the World Health Organization use our silver to do studies in Ghana uh, with malaria. And we anticipate starting uh, studies in uh, Kenya and Botswana uh, in the next year. And many, many other studies with malaria are currently ongoing. It claims internal and external use. We know that for a fact. We have a liquid form that's generally used for uh, internal uh, oral purposes for external use for burns and cuts and scrapes and wound healing. We have a gel that is used externally. So as you can see, uh, there are many uh, uh, claims on the patent that we have verified using silver saw technology. Silver saw passes through the body unchanged. That means it is catalytic. That has to do with the exchange of the two electrons I, sp I spoke of earlier. While one is killing, the other one is regenerating, and it passes through the body without making a metabolite or causing toxicity as a, a very, very small particle, which we talked about a little earlier, of the, nano, uh, the nanoparticle size, which is cleared from the body generally in 24 to 48 hours. It is extremely safe. It is a transitional metal. It is not a heavy metal. And by definition of the Merck uh, manual, for all of you purists out there, it does not accumulate in the fatty tissue, the kidney, uh, the liver, or the spleen enough to accumulate. So it is considered to be extremely safe. How about in kids? It, you know, the thing, the, the FDA precludes that you have to be very, very careful. We, we, re we make our claims down to the age of about six by definition. Uh, other than that, I don't, I try not to make claims but work just one-on-one -on -one with what the issue is. I, I, my fear is I don't want mothers treating babies and bypassing their pediatricians. So I like to do that one-on-one. -on -one. I do it with the pediatricians. When it comes to kids, I will tell you the gel is the best treatment of um, diaper rash that I have personally ever witnessed uh, in my 22 years in medicine, so I always really encourage for that. Uh, it can be used in children for things like ear infections and eye infections and such, but again, I, I don't want to encourage people to treat without the guidance of their pediatricians giving you um, your uh, recommendations for treating your children. But it is not, it has not been found to be uh, toxic in 
uh, the, uh, the use of children for colds and flu and, the, and things like that. Did that answer your question? Yes, yeah, thanks. OK. All right, so the thing that I would like to do now is let's, um, now that you know what it is, Let's look at how it works. So let's look at its three mechanisms of action. They're actually quite interesting. The first mechanism of action of silver sol is that of a silver oxide. It, it, what happens is silver sol particles attach to the very thin walls of pathogens. And understand, it's, it's interesting from a cellular biology standpoint, most pathogens have thin thin cell walls, unlike a healthy cells and healthy tissue which have thicker walls because they're, they're, they're pathologic. They're uh, reproducing very rapidly and they typically have a very thin wall. So the silver particles are able to attach to the thin walls of a pathogen and remove one or two electrons which kill it. It, it, it may disrupt the uh, cell wall. Uh, it may disrupt its charge, but it kills it by attaching to this very thin wall. In comparison to that, a normal cells have a much thicker and a much more protected membrane and a balanced charge, which results in selective protection from the silver oxide coating that kills pathogens on contact. People ask me about that a lot and say, well, how, how does it kill the, you know, my, the uh, bad things and not hurt my cells? Well, that's how. It kills on contact by pulling things to its surface and disrupting the cell membrane and the electrons, which do not look like healthy cells. And it does the same thing for yeast. I'm, frequ I'm frequently asked, well, if it, if it kills the bacteria or that are bad, that's one thing. But what about yeast? It does the same thing with yeast. Okay, moving along. The next mechanism of action is resonance. This also in, uh, involves the killing of yeast, um, and it involves resonance. Silver sol resonates at a, f a frequency which selectively is destructive to pathogens. Um, it kills bacteria, yeast, and viruses. For all our biophysics enthusiasts out there, and I always have a few uh, when I'm <coughs> talking and discussing the silver, this has been measured to be about be uh, between somewhere between 890 and 910 terahertz. That happens to be the same frequency that ultraviolet light resonates. So in the words of Dr. Peterson, who I mentioned earlier, I love this, can you imagine how tiny these little silver particles have to be to be absorbed into the bloodstream, onto the surface of blood cells, and to be able to resonate at the perfect frequency to transmit this ultraviolet waveform to destroy bacteria, viruses, and yeast, but be safe for surrounding tissue. It's just a beautiful system. How, how does that work? That, that's selective. I mean, because we, when people hear ultraviolet, they're like, ooh, no, that's dangerous for me. So how does that work? How, do, how, does, it selectively, how does it selectively collectively de destroy bad stuff and leave the good? Well, the good? again, it, 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 is, it propagates at a waveform that is selective for pathogens, much like uh, a lot of people buy these, um, these water filter systems now that the reason that water fil the filtration system can kill viruses in the water is because it can emit this, this uh, very, very small ultraviolet light uh, wave. I mean, ul ultraviolet light rays are hitting you all the time. And we know mm -hmm. that if they're too strong, some of them are bad, but they're hitting you all the time and not hurting you because the waveform is such that it's not harmful to your tissues. That is the same type of waveform that you see with the silver. It's not a harmful waveform. And in fact, there are waveforms moving throughout your body for every biochemical pathway that you have. If your body couldn't, if, if ultraviolet waveforms and other types of waveforms couldn't move through your body, you wouldn't have a way for biochemical pathways to happen. Mm. So they happen to be safe for you, but they're not safe for bacteria, viruses, and yeast. It's an absolutely perfect uh, relationship of uh, biology and nature for this silver to be able to propagate a wave 
form that does not hurt you at all, but is able to kill pathogens that are harmful to your tissue. Great. It's a very interesting phenomenon. Really mm -hmm. amazing. Yeah. The third, excuse me? Yes, I was just saying yes. Okay. The, the third mechanism of action is actual disruption of DNA within the viruses. And this is very important for you to understand for what's happening right now with the swine flu. Viruses have uh, both a sticky little capsule on the outside and these incomplete segments of DNA which carry a, just a slight magnetic charge, as does the little capsule. Viruses are nasty little creatures. They attach themselves to healthy um, cells and kind of inject this incomplete DNA into the cell, which then uses your uh, DNA to uh, replicate itself. The silver saw acts like a magnet both for the viral capsid and to the uh, charged DNA particles and shuts down their replication process so that as a result, the virus is inactivated. So that is the third mechanism of action. Now, I told you earlier that I'm very, very big on um, research and development. As a researching scientist myself and someone who's done um, extensive grassroots work with the silver, it was important to me that when I began uh, working with the silver saw um, scientists and with Dr. Patterson, that there were there were uh, studies and test series and antimicrobial tests that I could review and look at to know that there was research and development backing this product. Uh, it is quite broad and spans several decades. This this has been go ongoing much, much more than we've seen the silver on the market. Um, some of the laboratories and universities that have tested the product include, uh, and this is not inclusive, but just include uh, University of Georgia, Kansas State University, Penn State, Arizona State, University of Arizona, the University of California at Davis, Brigham Young University did extensive microbial uh, testing and plating and in vitro studies, uh, uh, organism by organ, microorganism by microorganism, um, as well as uh, third party independent testing facilities, government laboratories. There's over 60 universities, as you can see from the slide. Uh, I'm actually behind a little bit. I think we have uh, 200, we're up to 200 studies now. We have many, probably twice as many as 10,000 antimicrobial tests, and some of those studies because some of those 190 studies have series of hundreds of tests within them. There are 20 safety studies now. Um, to my knowledge, the makers of, um, of SilverSol technology, the owners of Silver te Technology, which is uh, American Biotech Laboratories, is the only manufacturer of nanosilver that has a full United States congressional testimony to the claims that the silver is made so that it could be FDA and EPA tested. And it has numerous U.S. government approvals and registrations. There are long-term studies with the U.S. military uh, for multi-drug resistant pathogens and parasites ongoing currently as we speak, um, giving me the um, interest to continue my own research, but also the comfort to use it in my patients, knowing that it's well-backed. So there's a lot to the research. People sometimes have a special interest in something and uh, call and ask me for research. And for anyone who's interested in any of those things, we would be happy to share with you uh, some of these studies. We ob for obvious reasons, we don't laundry list them. The list goes on and on. But I have um, an extensive uh, bibliography. Uh, and references for people that are interested in very specific applications. So speaking of applications, let's take a look at these are just a few of the things that I use my grass uh, root uh, research early on after reviewing the initial studies that I've just referenced. And the most common applications in my uh, practice as an, a regenerative and functional and 
uh, anti-aging doctor who also is board certified in OBGYN, uh, is for colds and flu, sinus infections, sore throat, and it can be sprayed in the throat or gargled. And for sinus infections, we use it in a metered uh, dose uh, nasal sprayer. It can be used for respiratory infections. It can be taken just by the uh, spoonful, and we, have a, we do have a suggested use sheets for our patients to tell them approximately how much to use. For respiratory infections, it can also be used in a nebulizer without any dilution. It, it can be used in an, an eardropper for ear infections. It can be used for skin infections, gastrointestinal disorders, food poisoning for yeast infections. It can be used in the gut. It can be used vaginally for yeast infections, and I have used it in all those applications. These are the most common ones that I thought would just be some good ones to go through to, keep, to give everyone an idea of how I use it in my practice. Now. In summary, for the lecture portion before we go on to uh, the pictorial portion, uh, why would you choose a silver saw product? Well, you know, there, it's a, there, uh, silver saw technology is a world-leading nano-silver technology uh, well-backed. It has a catalytic action, which means it, remo it moves through the body in very low, low concentrations, unchanged, and is excreted in the urine. It is non-toxic and proven safe, and in fact, we anticipate a human study this, uh, this year. Uh, even though we have 20 uh, other studies, animal studies, we anticipate a human study this year, which you rarely see, because, and we're very excited about that, because it is so safe and has been tested by both an EPA and FDA uh, laboratories. It's an award-winning uh, natural alternative. The American Biotech Lab has been cited for um, several awards and is going to uh, be awarded again uh, this year for their uh, innovative work. It's used and recognized by U.S. military and humanitarian organizations throughout the world. We discussed that a little earlier about the malaria research in the VA hospital and the military using it uh, in uh, the desert currently. And it's a patented, it's a patented product. It has a patented manufacturing process, its particle size is patent, so it has a product patent, and it has a human use patent. And there are some 39 patents pending or already in progress throughout the, the world globally. So this is a product I love. I'm comfortable with it. I'm using it in my patients and beginning my own research and development with it. And I'm extremely excited to share all of that with you. I want to take a look at a few case studies and show you a few more things before we uh, take questions and close tonight. If you get squeamish, um, a little squeamish at medical pictures, this may not be for you. I'll uh, tell you when we're done. And I would just like to show some illustrations on its uh, very dramatic abilities. This for first picture is from Singapore. Um, this uh, is a um, lady that is, uh, had a mastectomy who developed a MRSA infection for one year that was chronic and it, it could not, she could not get rid of it. And this is before Silversol was used in the form of a gel to treat her. So you can see the, um, let me get my pointer here. I can use my pointer. Can I, Sherry? Yes. There we go. Can everybody see that? Yes. This, this area particularly would not it would not heal. It was very raw and very infected. Uh, this, the, this are, the, are the lines from uh, the surgery, and you can see the discoloration in the skin and where the just chronic MRSA had um, left this uh, poor lady very, very infected. Here is a, just a 17 days after using the gel only once a day, 17 days later, you can now see hmm. where that horrible uh, unhealing ulcer is now starting to close, mm. and the uh, color of the skin is coming back, the flesh color of the skin, and this is 17 days with just once a day use. Wow, wow. So that's a pretty uh, remarkable difference, and I don't, I didn't uh, post the, the next slide, I believe we have is a 37-day slide, where it's showing at now day 37 the 
a wound is about 95% healed. Really impressive. This is a, this is a very graphic picture of uh, MRSA in a severe fungal infection, um, uh, causing increase of inflammation and preventing the wound from closing. You can see here how deep it is. You can get an idea of the depth of this injury, and you can see the uh, fungal degradation around the outside of the wound uh, uh, where the uh, MRSA started. This picture is now 19 days later where the silver saw killed the MRSA, and now you see the wound healing and beginning to close. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really, really impressive photos. Now, on, picture. So let me just ask this question real quick. Um, this, that patient, this same patient, had, had uh, treatment with other, uh, other agents, I, I presume. Uh, the, be, all of these treatments that had pre, it was preceded by multiple uh, treatments that failed. They all had multiple treatments that failed, and therefore they were willing to try the silver saw because nothing else had worked wow. in this particular okay. series. Okay. Ex with, with the exception of this, this patient, this patient is an 88-year-old lady who um, had third degree, second and third degree burns on her thighs from a spill. And I cannot remember if it was boiling water or, or, or oil. It was some kind of hot, excuse me, liquid. And that resulted in second and third degree burns. And so there are several issues um, at work here. Uh, you have an elderly geriatric patient whose immune system is already compromised by her very age. You have a full thickness, a third degree burns, along with the second degree burns, which is the redness and the uh, and the blistering. Very, very difficult injury to heal. This is a picture of this lady 65 days later. She did not receive antibiotics. She was kept. Her wounds were kept clean with soap and water and the uh, gel was applied, if I remember correctly, three times a day. So there's a couple of things here that are pretty miraculous to note. This is an 88-year-old lady whose legs look like this before we started. It's, it's a little bit hard to see, but if you look around the knees, you can kind of get an idea of what her skin looked like before her injury. So she had significant improvement even with what her skin looked like before she was burned. This is a, only 65 days later when she left to go home from the hospital. And anybody who's had a severe burn like that knows that what, is, what usually happens at recovery is there are severe retractions. You kind of get that melted cheese look to the skin. You see it kind of drawn up and pulled. And you don't see any of that here. She has just very minimal discoloration here. This was obviously a very se severe spot where it went through and through. She's got some very mild discoloration here, but you don't see those retractions and burn and pulls and that severe disfiguration that is so typical with the burn at only day 65 after her injury. Wow. So pretty, pretty remarkable. Yes, it is. This is a picture of bullus pemphigoid. Um, bullus pemphigoid is a very, very interesting phenomenon. Bullus pemphigoid is, uh, is a rare chronic condition uh, in which fluid-filled blisters or bullae erupt on the surface of the skin. This is a very severe case. It is usually not this severe. This is a pretty extreme ca a case. Uh, and pemphigoid usually occurs on the arms, the legs, or the trunk of the body. The cause is actually unknown, but it is thought to be autoimmune and related to a disorder, obviously, of the immune system. So that's very important for the silver. You know, one of our mantras about silver is it, 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 it's an immune system booster. It does help to boost the immune system. And this is obviously a very severe case with a very, very nasty uh, infection of the skin. The uh, four days after the gel, you can already see that this large area starting to granulate in. You can see that the leg, 
here's the normal leg, and you the swelling has gone down considerably, the color in the leg is starting to come back. And here's something that we get very, very excited about, about the silver. You'll see it more markedly in the next slide, but you can see here, and you can see here, little islands of normal tissue starting to regenerate itself. The typical regeneration and healing of a wound begins from the outside and goes to the inside. Our doctors and healthcare providers listening will know that. Leaving then what meets in the middle as a typical scar or pulling together of scars in the middle. So here, just four days later, you're already starting to see remarkable improvement in the wound. And now 10 days later, notice the stimulation to the stem cells where you can clearly see these little islands of cells recovering and the normal leg starting to come back and it's healing from the inside out. Just up to 10 days. At 10 days. My own, uh, my very own sister-in-law had an experience with this where she uh, had a surgery and required a graft on her back. The physicians were very, her doctors were very fearful that her graft was not going to uh, close in the very middle and that she would have a necrotic spot that would heal but would leave kind of a divot in the middle of her back. And the silver gel absolutely did this. In the middle where the graft wasn't taking and it looked like it was going to be necrotic, it completely brought it back and healed the edges from the inside out and she did not end up with a defect in the middle of her back. Mm -hmm. She's wow. a labor delivery nurse that now wants to become a wound care nurse. Guess why? <laughs> she was absolutely had an out-of-body DNA-altering experience from the use of the silver salt gel. Wow. The next patient that you're going to see, here's the background. This is from Singapore General Hospital. This is a 70-year-old 70 diabetic patient infected with MRSA who had an amputation ongoing for one year with antibiotics. This, this, this uh, kind of piggybacks on what you uh, asked earlier, David. This patient had a one year of antibiotics and maggot therapy to try to desperately close this amputation uh, wound, and it was unsuccessful. He was treated with a silver salt gel twice daily and given the liquid silver salt, which I talked a little bit about orally, two teaspoons twice daily. And now let's go through and see what we had. Here we started with with the uh, active therapy and the amputation that would not heal for a year. The diabetes, of course, is um, a barrier to that because of uh, immunocompromise and lack of blood flow. And this is now October the 13th, 2008. Here's what the wound looked like 25 days in after a year of not healing. Uh, with the application of silver salt gel and the oral uh, dosing regimen that we spoke of earlier. And now here is day 37, December 24th of 2008, this past year, now ready for an artificial limb, completely closed at day 37. <laughs> that is amazing. This is amazing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm used to seeing wounds last, <laughs> I mean, I've seen a few wounds like that never, ever close. This wound had not closed for one year when they started the therapy. So this That's next impressive. picture is a little easier to look at and maybe closer to home for, for people. Here's a MRSA uh, infection in a young lady, and you see the what's going to be familiar to lots of people in our audience. It seems like when I talk to patients all over the United States these days, everybody knows somebody who's had MRSA or they've had it themselves. Certainly people know somebody who's ever had it. And here's just that typical wet, slippery look of MRSA with the, um, uh, although this may also be because it has some gel on it, but it typically will look like that itself. It's oozy and weepy and it's got the blisters uh, coming up on the skin there. And now you will see on the next slide, here's the MRSA just 30 hours later after an application of the, of the silver, where you can already see that that weepy slipperiness gone, the blisters have gone down, and you see she's well on her way to healing. Wow. Well, you know, um, I, I just wanted to say this here, that I had actually seen this. Um, Gordon had just sent me the, the slide, um, some of, like this slide particularly, for about uh, November of last year, and we had him on the, on the webinar. Um, but what he mentioned then was that this lady just went to visit a friend in the hospital, 
So it wasn't like she had a problem. She just happened to pass by and visit a friend in the hospital, and that's when she had this, this, this infection. Right, and that scenario is extremely common. It's extremely common, and we hear it over and over and over again. MRSA is starting to pass through households. You know, that, again, is an entire uh, a lecture, and maybe we'll come back and uh, revisit this if we get a chance to do this again, and we'll talk about the difference between community-acquired MRSA, we'll talk about the difference between hospital-acquired MRSA, and we'll talk about the prevalence of it and why we're seeing it so much and how very effective the silver saw is against it, regardless, what, regardless of whether it is acquired through the hospital or through the community. But you're right, it doesn't take much, uh, David, to contract it with a very, very uh, uh, minimum amount of contact. It's really mm -hmm. quite frightening. Yes, so here's some, here's some final thoughts uh, for, you, for all of you, and, and we'll go to uh, uh, question and answer period of whatever, whatever uh, everyone wants to do. But there is definitely a new interest in silver preparation, uh, preparations. It's grown in recent years because of the emergence of antibiotic resistance and the superbugs people are so frightened of. There have been articles everywhere from in the USA Today to the front of Time magazine. You can hardly talk to a person uh, nowadays that has not heard of MRSA or VRE, vancomycin resistant enterococcus, and has had an experience in their family or with a loved one having an infection. The growing ineffectiveness of many, of many types of antibiotics is recognized in both the medical community by the CDC and the World Health Organization, as well as the general lay public. Years of testing and scientific re, uh, research has resulted in the creation of stable, effective, and safe silver salt technology. It's been tested by both the Environmental Protection Agency and the Food and Drug Administration. Silver salt preparations not develop bacterial resistance, and doctors and scientists from all over the world have tested and validated their power. Hundreds and hundreds of, of studies and tests, to include dozens of safety studies, have been completed at major universities and independent laboratories now. So in closing, I would just say um, in, my, in my travels and following of the recent headlines today, this, uh, again from this afternoon, the U.S., as of 2 o'clock this afternoon when I was reviewing to prepare for you all this evening, has declared that health emergency uh, so that we could ship roughly 12 million doses, David, of flu-fighting medications from a federal stockpile to various states in cases that they eventually need them. You know, doesn't it make sense to keep something on hand for you and your family and your loved ones that can fly, that can fight swine flu and so much more. Absolutely. So, you know, it's my hope that everyone will give themselves a fighting chance against disease and illness using cutting edge silver salt technology. And I've enjoyed uh, being with you all tonight. Well, thank you very, very much, Cindy. Um, I just want to say, say just right on what you last said. As ever since I heard about this, and ever since we had Dr. Pedersen on the call or on the webinar, um, that was like I said about seven, now six, seven months ago, and I, I've always had the silver solution in my in my, uh, in, my, in, my, in, my in my possession. I have about two bottles now, and uh, I have a family family friend who has ten kids. Uh, her sister has about six kids. And we got a silver solution for them, for them all. And any time they have an infection, any time there's something going on, they just use a few drops, and it works instantaneously. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised at the results that they are getting that they tell me about. So um, there is a lot of legitimacy to what uh, Dr. Eden has spoken of, and really encourage you to, to take a look at this. Um, no question, there is just so much out there that you just don't want to be caught without some kind of protection. Uh, again, thanks a lot, Cindy, for this presentation. This is the historical perspective was really, really enlightening. We're going to do some questions now. Uh, Sherry, you have any questions there? Uh, yeah, sure. Somebody wanted to know why are silver fillings not good for you? Um, that's a very good question. It has to do with the composition. Um, again. We're talking about the difference between metallic silver and transitional silver, and they're very different. 
It's the composition. A dentist would be better to answer this than I am, but I'm going to take a stab at it. It is the composition of the silver. It is, in fact, what it is mixed with, and therefore what it releases when it breaks down. So understand that silver in that composition is very different than what we talked about here tonight. Okay. Do you have a document or study for using silver salt in disinfectant or for dis disinfectant in medical and dental clinics that is acceptable to the Department of Health? We are so excited about something that is coming down the pike very soon. We do have a topical disinfectant that uses um, hydrogen peroxide mixed with the silver salt that can be sprayed as a topical. I have uh, EMS is really waiting for that. Operating rooms are waiting for that because it can be sprayed topically and it doesn't necessarily have to be wiped down. So it's great for disinfecting um, ambulances and uh, uh, fine equipment and things like that that you need to use over and over again. The, there is, um, if that person would like to get in touch with us individually, there are already dental practices that are using the liquid to flush dental lines and use it in a dental capacity. I, uh, Dr. Pedersen and I have just recently made two DVDs which I think a lot of people will probably find helpful. One is for practitioners and one is for patients or consumers. And in the dental realm, you can actually use the gel, because it, the gel is a food quality gelant, to brush your teeth and rinse your mouth uh, and all those things in, the, in uh, the dentist's office. And the dentist can use it to flush their lines and do those kinds of things. We can help you with that, and we can answer those questions if you want to contact us one-on-one. -on -one. We'd be happy to help you with that. We can help you with that. In Canada, they're already using it in that capacity. And this is the website you, um, the, you want them to contact you with? They can go to probiosil.com where it says contact us. They can uh, use one of the contact points there and the information, leave their information. It will get to me and I will either contact them or put the proper person in contact with them. Okay, great. And folks, um, great uh, and yes, we can help. And folks, uh, uh, just, I just received a text here saying um, if you want to buy the, the silver solution, um, there's a discount that's applied to every, all the people who join this webinar, and it's going to be on for about seven days, and it's a 20% discount for whatever purchase you make from this website. Using, of course, you have to use that, that code to get a discount in the first place. So um, just so you know, after seven days, it's back to full price. <laughs> okay, Sherry, what's your question? Okay, Cindy, what is the caution about the people are hearing about people turning blue from an overdose of silver? That is another great question, and I am so sad that I did not um, f have time to download the picture of that guy who was on Oprah, and therefore the whole universe called me the day after that show and said, <laughs> am I going to turn blue? Um, that man is very interesting. He had, and I really need to find his particulars and add it to my lecture. Um, the day that I watched it actually on YouTube, he had some kind of a horrible skin condition, and I don't quote me, I, because I think it was a psoriasis or eczema type of condition that was so severe. In other words, he got such breaks in his skin that he got super infected with MRSA, and what he called flesh-eating bacteria, which is really what MRSA looks like when it super infects something like eczema or psoriasis. And he found out that colloidal silver, which, you know, you can use, you can, people make at home using just two crude electrodes, that he could make his own silver. Well, he made his own silver. The problem is when you make silver at home like that, the content of the silver is thousands and thousands times higher than a silver saw is because it doesn't, it doesn't have the nanotechnology supercharging the particle. And this guy was drinking like a quart of this silver a day for years, and he actually didn't mind being blue. According to him, he actually didn't mind being blue because he got rid of this flesh-eating bacteria, and then he had his 15 minutes of fame, so then he really didn't mind being blue. <laughs> that condition is called argyria, and one thing I want people to understand is 
you, you look like a Smurf, but it is not toxicity. It's toxicity in the sense that it deposits in the skin and doesn't come out and you turn blue. It is not toxicity like heavy lead poisoning that's going to kill you. But it's very important. Argyria is important. The risk of argyria is important, which is why you have to be very, very careful about what kind of silver you use. And if you want to know more about Argyria, A-R-G-Y-R-I-A, please go to our website and read about Argyria. And if you want to do more reading beyond the scope of that, there are a million websites out there where you can read about it. But Argyria includes this turning a bluish color because the particle is big enough. Remember we talked about particle size and how teeny tiny nanoparticles are. The particle is big enough to... Um, group with other particles and stick in the skin and cause that blue color. That same blue color that nobility and royalty got from eating off of silverware that flaked into their mouths back in the uh, medieval times and turned them a bluish hue which then caused them to be caused blue bloods. It's the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. It's not fatal. It's just which it's just permanent. And here's what's interesting about that. It's always been, when you read the literature, to including our literature, you will see people say it's not fatal, but it is irreversible. It's permanent. But I recently spoke to a, an alternative medicine doctor who called me to say it may not be permanent. I'm currently working on chelation therapy that I think can at least partially reverse argyria. So stay tuned. I, you know, I don't know where that's going to go, but there are people working with chelation therapy that say they may be able to reverse argyria. So it may not even be permanent. But that's just a side note. Okay. So can can it become ineffective from overuse? It cannot become. A, it, silver salt does not develop resistance. There is not the mechanism of resistance okay. as like antibiotics have. This is really probably going to be the biggest pushing point that you see silver coming coming back, coming back, coming back, because there's no resistance. So isn't it interesting that we started with silver, we lost silver to antibiotics because they were cheaper and they were technically more competent at the time. Mm. Now we've learned how to use technology to modernize them, and they're going to clean up where antibiotics have possibly left off. Mm. Just a theory. Just it is exciting. It's exciting. All right. I mean, what you said about malaria is of particular in interest to me because I come from a culture where uh, malaria is just wreaking havoc up, up till now, and it's um, all over the southern my country, uh, Ghana, um, Ghana, all those West African countries. Malaria is just doing laying waste to kids, and that's one of the reasons why. Um, people they deliver so many kids because they want to have a few left after after childhood that can still carry on the family name. <laughs> so um, it it's, it's impressive really, that's where. In the year two thousand and nine, how sad is that? I know. In these I modern know. times, but uh, as I was saying earlier, I'm hoping Botswana has you know formed their medical school. They're graduating their first class this year. It's being uh, supported by the government, and they've taken up a partnership with the University of Pennsylvania, and we are anticipating uh, starting a partnership research project on both AIDS and malaria at uh, University of Botswana Medical School. I'm very excited about that. Great. Are there any plans for using silver salt for immune deficiency disorders, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, ETC? That uh, remains to be looked at. I've got very high hopes with that because I, for uh, a lot of fatigue-related diseases, my patients with fibromyalgia, my patients with lupus, my patients with Crohn's disease, particularly when yeast is exacerbating their Crohn's flare-ups, do extremely well on the, on the silver. And I have them take one teaspoon a day for maintenance. If they're having a flare, it depends on how severe the flare is, I may increase them to as much as 30 cc's, which is like a little NyQuil cup a day, and they seem to uh, be doing well. And again, it will, I think there will be some time, David, before we formalize these into, you know, double-blinded studies, but there's nothing wrong with doing anecdotal studies now and seeing these patients get so much better in a grassroots effort, which is really where I've been for the last several years. Mm -hmm. Also, does silver soul have a role in treating skin damage from radiation cancer treatment? 
and it, would it would it have any interaction expected interaction with the radiation at all? I have an, I actually have a letter from um, that American Biotech Labs received about a radiation on, from a radiation oncologist. They want to say it was in California that used it in all of his radiation uh, patients. Uh, post-radiation and reported that in the majority of them, I can't remember the exact percentage, I wanted to say it was 80, the high 80s, reported uh, relief of their symptoms. So obviously he's using it. You would not expect it to undo or, um, you know, you're trying to kill bad cells with it, so you want the good skin to recover. Mm -hmm. So that, there was a, a, that has been done. And that is ongoing for relief from those poor patients after radiation therapy. Are you having success in using Silversol in cases where it is used as a first-line treatment rather than after all else fails? Meaning, are you experiencing opposition from the medicals <laughs> until they admit that their care has failed? Well, let me tell you what happens with this. When you're a doctor that begins to use this in patients in their clinic, and I'm going to now, you're going to force me to tattle on myself. Because when I first used the silver, when I first started using the silver many years ago, I was a little nervous myself. And so I would use it in addition to antibiotics, and then the patients got well so quickly, I started to cut them back. And I started to give patients just a few days of antibiotics, and they continued to get well very quickly. And then finally, we all got brave enough, meaning myself and the patients, because I've been now in Florida 10 years in my practice and have a lot of patients I see very regularly. And we stopped using antibiotics in the patients that chose not to do so, and they had very rapid recover, recoveries. And then it was kind of out of my hand, because what happened was, in these mostly women, initially before I started doing anti-aging medicine, their children would get sick and they would not want to give their children antibiotics and they would just give their children the silver and they got well very rapidly. Well, then that progressed to they started giving their children silver regularly and their children just didn't get sick. <laughs> and if they got sick, they didn't stay sick for very long. And interestingly enough, that coincided, uh, David, with the American Academy of Pediatrics now not wanting to give kids all these antibiotics. Really? It, coincide, it coincided with people coming and saying, my, you know, my pediatrician doesn't really, you know, it says I can't, shouldn't, we shouldn't keep getting, you know, antibiotics for all these ear infections. It's, it's causing yeast. It's causing uh, resistance. What should I do? And I was just a chicken. I said, I'm not a, I'm not a pediatrician. Do what your pediatrician says. I don't know. I was terrified. And that's how I know. They were using it for themselves. They were the moms. You know how moms are. They started giving it to the kids. And that's why I know anecdotally they got better. And then they just didn't get sick anymore. But, I, you know, I really say that kind of tongue-in-cheek because that's totally anecdotal from the experience I've had in my practice with my patients mm. and their families and their families' families. Because now it's really starting to propagate out there as people realize this is a mineral supplement. What do I have to lose? If I don't get better, then I'll go, you know, and see about it. If, I, if it's just the cold, a cold or the flu and not something horribly serious. Right. I right. get those calls every week. You know, can I try it? What should, you know, what should I do? Mm. Well, Cindy, as an OBGYN, what, has your, how, what have your results been with um, yeast infections in women? In yeast infections, the results have been no, le no less than spectacular. A word I hesitate to use, but now I'm just telling the truth. When women come in, women, first of all, women have yeast a lot, not necessarily vaginal yeast, but since my training in the A4M started five years ago, I've just paid so much more attention to leaky gut syndrome and disseminated yeast in women. It's incredible how much yeast women have. And I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, there's a large number of women in the workforce now. I think it's a combination of stress. You know, it's a bad diet as we all have begun working and we don't have as much time to cook dinner. We're not necessarily cooking the right things for dinner. 
and yeast in, yeast in the system usually eventually leads to yeast vaginally. And what I discovered after doing my research about the silver saw is that if women, if I felt like women had a leaky gut and they had all the symptoms that um, my teachers at the A4M were teaching me, like, you know, headaches and irritable bowel type synd uh, syndrome and they weren't sleeping properly and they had a lot of heartburn and didn't feel good and migraines. I mean, the list of symptoms is incredibly long. I would put them on the oral yeast, I mean, the oral uh, silver saw, and I would have them placed about an, a nickel size amount of the silver gel on a tampon and wear it for about 90 minutes. This is in my new DVD that's coming out that I did with Dr. Pedersen, who gave me this recipe. And they would wear it for 90 minutes and take it out and be treated. And it was so successful that unless somebody specifically says, I don't want to do that, give me X, Y, Z, I don't even offer anything else for yeast in my patients except the silver saw. I don't even offer anything anymore. Mm. And what we anticipate, what we're working on now, is a smaller tube of the silver saw with an applicator so that it can be used by women for that express purpose. Mm. Another question that's somewhat related, um, it's can the silver saw be used um, intravaginally for reversal of abnormal pap smears or eliminating the HPV infection? Well, let me tell you what the rule on that is. I can make no claims on that. Mm -hmm. The FDA says I may not make a claim on that because HPV is potentially cancer-causing. So I am not permitted to make a claim on that. Mm -hmm. And I, I will, so all I will tell you is that I have used it for HPV, to treat HPV. That, and I will not make a claim on it, but I have used it for that purpose. With the, what, what what has the FDA approved uh, you to say on this particular technology? Nothing. Uh, uh, the technology overall? Mm -hmm. All the things that I showed in the slides, that it is effective against bacteria, it's effective against yeast, it's effective against viruses, it's effective against all those things. We, we, we specifically are not allowed to make a claim against HPV because HPV is potentially cancer-causing, and therefore you're making a cancer claim in the eyes of the FDA. But you can Give say that it's effective against viruses. It is effective against viruses. <laughs> okay. that we can and I can tell you as a physician, I mean, I can tell you anything I've done, and I will tell you that in my clinic I have, yes, used it against HPV. But that's all I can tell you. Mm. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, am I next, Sherry? You're next. I'm next. Okay. What is the shelf life of silver soul? I think I know the answer to that. What, the well, shelf first, life. tell me what you think the answer is. <laughs> it sounds like it's infinity, right? It lasts forever almost. Well, it, it lasts a very, very long time because the particles stay in solution and they stay suspended. But again. The FDA, EPA require us to put an expiration date on that bottle, just like they require it for everything else. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know what the expiration date is because, hypothetically, there shouldn't be one. Right, right. Because it's a nanoparticle which stays suspended. It does not settle. It does not uh, break down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is there an extra cost to ship to uh, Australia? we got some folks down under who, look, who want to know that. That is a very good question, and I will find that out. I do not know the answer to that question off the top of my head, but I would surely love to get it down under. Mm. Um, Tyler, I will tell you, I, I had somebody in... Um, I had somebody from Australia tell me that they do use silver-coated dressings there. Mm-hmm. Tyler just typed in yes. T Tyler typed in yes to what? It does, it's extra? That we can ship to Australia. Oh, I'm sure we can ship there. There's no question. We can ship anywhere in the world. There's no question. Okay. What that will entail will remain to be seen, and we can find that out quickly and very easily. Okay. Um, here's somebody. Her husband left for Mexico a week ago. 
and he's going to be returning back home. She had chemo three years ago. She does lots of immune protecting things with supplements, but because she had chemo three years ago and she's wondering if her immune system might be somewhat compromised, she's wondering if when he returns home, if she should leave for a few days, if she's going to be safe, him just being in Mexico. What do I, what I would recommend for her is that she get a nasal, that she get the silver, get a nasal sprayer, spray each nostril, two sprays in each nostril um, twice a day, and take one teaspoon once a day. Okay, thank That's you. That's what I would recommend. I mean, when people are, when people have MRSA or people are colonized with MRSA and we're trying to keep people safe or we're trying to keep someone that's colonized uh, to get rid of the MRSA, we have them spray their nostrils two times, each nostril, twice a day. That absorption through the mucosal membrane is excellent. Mm. excellent. And, you know, the, you know, the people are so afraid of the swine flu. The other thing I've been telling them to do is to get the, you know, it's not very expensive. I tell them to get the liquid and the gel. You can take the gel and put a little bit on your finger and literally put it in your nostril, in each no a little gel in each nostril, like a pea size. It doesn't burn or sting. It's what's what, another reason it's great in kids, because it doesn't burn or sting. And pinch your, pinch your nostrils together and then kind of snort as you let go. And coat, you know, just get that gel coating the whole inside of your nose so that when people are coughing or sneezing or whatever and those particles come to you, that gel is lining the inside of your nose. And do it like three times a day. Like for, I, I would tell that to like teachers, people who know kids are going to be coughing and sneezing around them all day. You know, they should take the gel and put it up there, let it coat, and, you know, give it a sniff and keep it inside the nostril. Here's a question from a lady who says um, her husband left for a week to, to Mexico, and even though I, meaning her, I take glyconutrients plus other amino protective supplements, I had chemo three years ago, and I wonder if I should leave for a few days when he returns, or what might I do to ensure that I am safe? That's when I just did, David. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but I put it in my own girl words. Sorry, I threw you off. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I apologize. I think okay. She should, spray in, uh, she should spray her nostrils, and I think take the liquid, and be fine. I would only admit. Uh, I would only advise that she left if she started to get prodromal for the flu. Then I'd. I wouldn't leave. I'd put him somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> I'd send him to quarantine and stay in my house, but that's just me. <laughs> okay. Uh, David, you must have Dr. Sherry Tenpenny come to talk about flu. She is great. Have you heard about her? Sherry Tenpenny. You know who that is? I have not, but I love I love listening to anybody who has expertise on disease states. Well, we I have this. Um, here, well, I love that kind of education. I think it's really helpful. Well, Moira Dolan is an MD who has been on on, on on several of our webinars, and she just does an excellent job. She she just typed that in, and she says, "Well, we need to get all these do all these female doctors together for a party. You guys do a great job. So <laughs> maybe we should. Maybe we should do a panel, Sherry." Yeah, and I, t I, t I typed to Moira that I have the Wonder Woman video ready if they ever need it. <laughs> right. That's all you need, a Wonder Woman video and some dark chocolate from Europe, and you are set. <laughs> there you go. All right, someone says, what about with pregnancy? You know, the, the, I, I always am asked two questions. One, does it cross the blood uh, br uh, brain barrier? And uh, nano silver definitely does do that. And what concentrations is being studied? And there's not an exact answer on that, but yes, blood, uh, uh, particles have been seen on the other side of the blood-brain barrier. The particle is so incredibly small. I obviously don't have a study because we're not going to study pregnancy. We don't recommend anything in pregnancy, not because we don't think it's okay, but because the again the FDA doesn't allow us to say, sure, go ahead and use the silver in pregnancy. You you can't do that. You can't do that with anything in pregnancy, and so we don't we have no study to quote. We have um, no data to turn to for pregnancy. It has. Uh, been found in breast milk, so clearly it travels through the system, and the particle is very small. I mean, I would just say, from common sense, it must pass into the placenta. 
but we don't advocate it in pregnancy just like nobody advocates anything in pregnancy because everyone's scared to death of that topic. So again, that's another one of those rock and a hard places where when mm -hmm. people ask me, can I use it in pregnancy, I don't feel comfortable saying yes because I'm not supposed to say yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I will just leave it at that so people don't, you know, no, don't, so people understand how bad I feel to have to say that, but those are the rules with right. pregnancy. Is cervical first all something that can be used for hives? Depends. You know, it's um, it depends. It is an anti, it is a potent anti-inflammatory. Um, so it should work. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had patients that my children use it for acne. My sons are 13 and 15. They use it for acne. Wash the face, put it on in the morning. Wash the face, put it on at night. Uh, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't get rid of their acne in just one day because you realize that half the component for the acne is hormones, and it doesn't change the hormones. Unfortunately. But um, there is always a bacterial component. Right. Well, and on speaking the of hormones, where anything hormonal is involved, you know, it does boost the immune system. People ask me all the time, what, what about cancer? What about this thing? Well, again, we can't make cancer claims. But I think that a lot of the reason why these patients with lupus and fibromyalgia, I'm not saying it's getting rid of their pain, but they, they, I think they feel better because clearly the, the silver plays an anti-inflammatory role. And the anti-inflammatory role may be something as, as simple as reducing your viral and bacterial load to the point where the exacerbations of your underlying uh, malady are improved. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And kind of a related question is, does the silver solution improve inflammation of any kind? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, what are it does that. I'm not sure to tell you the truth, Cherry. By what exact mechanism? We just know that it does from the results that we see. Well, I guess once you remove the offending agent, the body can now have, have, have the ability to heal. And I think that's what a lot of it is. Is people have all these symptoms and they have arthritis and they they hurt and they ache and they have pain and they have swelling and a lot of it is yeast overgrowth or it's mm -hmm. viral or it's bacterial. And when you get rid of the offending agents, like you said, even though it's not a quote-unquote infection like the flu or a cold, you just never know. You may be get, getting rid of some kind of in, uh, inflammatory or insulting pathogen that's not obvious, and therefore your symptoms improve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, here's a great question, but I'm going to ask this one before it. I know you can answer that real quick. Any drug interactions to, wa to watch out for? No. Okay. It does not interact with other drugs uh, or medications, to my knowledge, and to this date. Okay. Which is over right. 10 years. Right. Does, in fact, no, it, will it, it will also not interfere with the mechanisms of other drugs. In fact, it is synergistic with antibiotics. Mm. Great. Right. you bring so, up your point, let me just mention this quickly. I have an extremely severe, and I mean severe, MRSA infections, given the liquid internally, the gel externally to the lesions like we saw in the lady, the blisters and this weeping horrible redness, and uh, antibiotics, but simple antibiotics, Septra, um, Bactrim, those kinds of things. Okay. Does it affect the good bacteria in the gut? Does not. The good bacteria in the gut do have a balanced charge and a big thick wall, and they are not affected. It will take the yeast, but it will not take, because you know, what the reason people ask that, and it's a great question, because in mm -hmm. the old days, colloidals really worked by disrupting anaerobic bacteria. Well, people know there's anaerobic bacteria in your gut that aren't bad, they're good. Right. And right. So they used to give colloidal silver along with probiotics, so that when you wiped out all the anaerobes, the probiotics put the good anaerobes back. Well, that's the difference between that, those old-fashioned colloidals and this now, you know, uh, 10,000 uh, um, hertz uh, super silver. It does not disrupt the good anaerobes in the gut, but it takes the yeast out. Yeah, I think that was a great question, too. That's really that was a great question. question, and that's what that stems back from, because people know, they've heard things in the past that, hey, you know what, it takes off the bad with the good, and you've got to replace it with the probiotics. Well, that was the previous generation of colloidals, specifically. Okay. And ionics. Ionics did the same thing if, they, uh, part, if it was, the concentration was too high. 
I don't have any more questions on this side, Sherry. Do you have any? A couple. I I might have missed her answering this. Could you use the gel mix with saline to irrigate sinuses for sinus infections? Absolutely not. The one <laughs> thing that you that is a fantastic question. The one thing you cannot mix silver with is salt, because mm. the chloride ions steal those positive Ag2 ions. Mm. You know, you have mm. a positive charge and a negative charge. A chloride ion is a negative charge. It'll steal the charge, uh -huh. and it'll it, then you take away its power. Mm. And so, if you're going to mix it for something with the sinuses, you mix it with distilled water. If you're going to douche with it. In the vagina, you take a, dis again, this is in the DVD, and it's, we demonstrated it very nicely, but, well, we didn't literally demonstrate it, we just showed the container. <laughs> I was going to say, boy, I don't want people to think I, like, made some pornographic DVD, but you just, you, you know, open the, you open the disposable douche, you pour it out, and you fill it halfway with distilled water and halfway with silver. So don't ever mix silver with saline solution or any kind of salt or anything because it'll steal the ions back. It'll, it'll, it's like putting kryptonite on Superman. Mm. Mm. You don't want to do that. But you can, you can, I have tons of patients that flush their sinuses and they just use distilled water and the silver or they just use the silver. Okay, good. Um, which brings me, brings me to another question. Um, at pH levels, how does this help with balancing your blood pH? No, the all. pH is silver. The pH, to to my recollection, is about six point three three. So you know it's um you know uh, neutral is seven. This is about six point three three. It's a little bit on the acidic side. That's that's just the way it balances out. Okay. What about with psoriasis? People with psoriasis. I have the most beautiful before and after psoriasis patient, but the pictures were really blurry and I wasn't able to put it on. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. A couple things about psoriasis. Uh, the psoriasis is very um, severe, and if, when you go to the website, when people go to the website, www.probiosil.com, in the drop down. Sherry. That was not me. I didn't touch anything. What happened? I don't know. Oh. When they go to the drop-down sheets, they'll see some of these things I'm talking about. There's four pages of usage sheets for the gel. There's three pages of usage sheets for the liquid. But um, for really severe psoriasis, I recommend a combination of oral and topical therapy. You can mix, you can mix the gel with petroleum jelly mm. or with aloe so that it stays on the surface a little bit longer before it goes in, or you can just use it, you know, right right out of the tube. Um, and it's very, very effective, very effective mm -hmm. against psoriasis. Dermatologists love it. Mm. Now, if somebody was interested in getting a copy of that DVD, would they get it from your website? They would get it from the website okay. because we have a long, long list of people waiting for that DVD. And I'm mm -hmm. sure that that will go right to the website so they can see it and have some fun with it. So you be sure to let us know so we can we can also promote it on, on this on this side. Yeah, I, I made that with Dr. Pedersen. We did it as an interactive. We thought that would be a little, uh, that would be more interesting for the doctors as well as the patients. And it keeps it moving along and lets them see us kind of mixing things and how we do things. I anticipate just some more and more of those in the future. It came out really, really well. And well, Tyler, Tyler said, I, oh, go ahead. Okay. Tyler types in that it'll be ready in two weeks. It'll be ready in two weeks. Okay, there's your answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe one last question. H have you had any reports of sensitivities or allergies to the product? Not yet. We, you know, we anticipate there's really nothing for it to be allergic to unless someone is just blatantly allergic to silver. I haven't been able to find that person yet. Mm -hmm. um, and there's absolutely nothing reported. And to be allergic to, you know, and even if they were allergic, I mean, the, the particles are so small. Uh, I don't know that you'd be able to remount, mount much of a response. If you could mount a response to Silversol, then that would mean that you would not be able to eat off of silverware. You know, there's silver in dirt. There's silver everywhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's ubiquitous. It's, it's a naturally occurring mineral. So it would be highly unusual to find somebody allergic to it. I haven't found one yet. If someone ever finds someone allergic to silver, let me know. 
not, <laughs> me, not metal, but silver mineral. And again, the amount would be so very small. Mm -hmm. I would surely hope that if that ever happened, somebody would let me know. We haven't mm -hmm. seen it yet in 10 years, Sherry. Mm, okay. Mm. Well, uh, we still have we still have quite a number of people left. So uh, this this has been <laughs> people have loved this webinar from from what I can see. Um, do you have I any think more? My mother probably sends it. My mother sends people checks, so she might have sent them all a check. <laughs> so on the line. She has a habit of doing that. <laughs> well, she loves you, doesn't she? That's, um, that's what it is. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you have anything else you want to leave us with? Leave I don't think up? so. Again, I would encourage people to use the website as a resource. I do. Um, I I've written a newsletter on the historical aspects of probiocil. I am currently working on a MRSA newsletter. I have been asked as the next newsletter to write something on. Um, acne, and so I'll write something on acne. I'm always interested to know what people want to know about. So if you have a great topic for a newsletter that you'd like to see me give an opinion on or do some writing on, please feel free to uh, contact the website and give us some ideas. I mean, this is all about the people, David. This is all about the power of knowledge. It's about right. educating people to give them the power to care for themselves. Right. Absolutely. And that's why we do what we do, and that's why you do what we do, what you do, and that's why somehow our paths have crossed. Mm -hmm. yep. And Cindy, would you put... We're in the same high-touch kind of business. Cindy, would you mm -hmm. put the slide back up that has the website? Um, it, I'm looking at it. Uh, what are you seeing, David? Uh, winning the fight with, silver, with new silver technology. Yeah, I'm just seeing a, a blank screen. Oh, really? Huh. Okay. Uh, does, someone, does somebody want to know? Where to buy? Does someone need to see what the website to? address again? Oh, there was that off air. Uh, well, sure. You just want to type type in the information sure. that they need. Okay. Sure. Sure. Um, again, folks, the uh, the website information is probiosil.com. Sherry's typing that in, so if you need to see it, it's in the chat box. Um, again, you have about a week if you want to make any orders. <clears throat> you have a week to get a 20% discount, and you type in BSW, which of course stands for Building Strength Webinars. Uh, Dr. Eden, again, I just want to say a big thank you, and we definitely will be having you on. Are you coming on next week? Well, we'll have to debate that tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. That's fine. We'll we'll we'll, we'll figure but it I out. Want, I want to come back. I want to come back as soon as I possibly can. The issue isn't coming back. The issue is my schedule because I have two other seminars. So it is a scheduling issue, not a, you know, I'd love to come back tomorrow. I can talk <laughs> about this, as you well know from speaking to me, forever. But um, it is just a scheduling. It's not a matter of uh, want. It's a matter of making it fit my schedule. Got and it. I'll be Got glad. It. I would be delighted. It would be my privilege to be back with you. Mm -hmm. Well, you. you have an op open door here. We we'll welcome you with wide open arms, uh, folks. Next week, uh, we're going to have well the, for the month of May. Watch out! The month of May, we're going to do something new. It's going to be uh, a May, an amazing month. So uh, there's mm -hmm. something new coming up. We're going to be sending out emails on Wednesday, right? So Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, right, Sherry? Yep. Yep. Okay. Be sure to open the emails from us later this week. Be sure to open the emails, yes, because this is, this is different. It is not business as usual. Okay? All right. Well, again, thank you, Dr. Eden, and good My night, pleasure. everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night.